Welcome to the Q&A Cafe, coming to you this August afternoon from the studios of the Office of Cable Television. It's in the Intelsat building of Connecticut Avenue, which given the subject, spooks and spycraft and whatnot, couldn't be a better location actually, though I'm not accusing Intelsat of having any spies in this building. But uh, our guest today is uh, Shane Harris. He is many things, but to start, he is the author of The Watchers and uh, The Rise of America's Surveillance State, and he's also my colleague at Washingtonian Magazine. So, Shane, this is in many ways a first, mm. because uh, I, have, I have a policy that I don't generally talk to my guests before an interview. Well, we, you've, you've gone through that policy now. We've I've, blown it. We've burned it. We've blown it. Because blown it. all we do is talk all day long. All day long. Occasionally we do this some This is just work. like being at work. Yes, this is just like being at work, <laughs> except they're going to make me sit up straight the okay. whole time. I'll sit up straight with you. <laughs> but uh, I'm really happy to have you here. I'm glad to be here. Thank uh, you. Welcome to our little home. Um, and, and, and for regular viewers of, of uh, the Q&A Cafe, we will be back at the Ritz, but we're going to be here a little more often, too. We're going to be back and forth. But uh, I do want to talk to you about, and I wasn't kidding when I said spooks and spycraft, because that you cover many things for Washingtonian, but you also have this area of expertise that's outside of just what we call general assignment. I thought I'd start by just asking, um, how did you get into the beat of the intelligence industry? Yeah, it com very much by accident on my part. Um, the short answer to it is 9-11. Um, it, it truly, my career in this area sort of begins quite literally on that day and has been sort of a progression mm -hmm. from that. But uh, in 2001, I went to go work for a magazine here in Washington called Government Executive, which is part of the conglomerate that is National Journal and The Atlantic, David Bradley's Enterprise. Uh, and I was sort of a junior technology reporter. And my job basically was to write about um, technology in the federal government, sort of how agencies were using computers and using the web. Mm -hmm. And you know, at the time, this was, you know, this was, this wasn't dawn of the internet, but it was still relatively new. And you know, everybody in the federal government thought technology is going to solve all our problems and you'll be paying your taxes online and there's this sort of wonderful nexus between these technology companies from Silicon Valley that had lost their shirts in the yeah. dot-com boom now coming to Washington and they're going to become government contractors. So this was a really kind of heady sort of space. Um, I did that for about nine months and literally was woken up one morning. I was in California by a phone call from a friend of mine saying you need to turn on the television. Yeah. Fla planes have flown into the World Trade Center. Um, I woke up, wake up, I look at this kind of unfolding. I remember the first thing I thought was, you know, I was sort of a child in the, the height of the Cold War. I mean, I was, you know, born in 76 and sort of grew up under this specter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, baby. It's still fresh. Uh, but really, I mean, thinking to myself, this is exactly what I'd imagine it was going to look like when the world ended. Like, mm. this was sort of the, you know, Are I grew you up watching terribly. Yeah. I mean, and also the terrorism wasn't even on my radar screen. I mean, this was not even an area that I paid any attention to. I mean, I loved, you know, Tom Clancy books and things like this what in Bond movies, but, you know, no, no concept of this ever happened. One of the interesting things to me about technology, and, and you touch on this a lot in your book, is that I get the impression that the tech industry goes to the intelligence industry first to try things out, yeah. or that the intelligence industry wants the tech industry to come to them first. Yeah, there's sort of, there has, there's, there's a long tradition of that. You know, some of the you know, the technology that we take for granted today was developed by government and industry and the military and industry in concert. The internet is the best example. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the, much like medicine, you know, some of, the, some of the most productive drugs that are out there were created in the process of trying to find treatments for AIDS, right. other forms of cancer, but That's then they right. go, oh, this does this and oh, this does that. But in particular, I think of, uh, you write a lot about John Poindexter, and I'll let you um, tell the audience who he is, but what was interesting to me is on that same day when 9-11 happens, uh, or actually we should go back, it's when the bombing of the, um, it's when the bombing the in Marine, Be in Marine yeah. Barracks in Beirut happens. John Poindexter pulls out his compass computer mm -hmm. 
and it's something out of a sci-fi novel. Right, right. But why, why don't you say a, just a little bit about who John Poindexter is in this, in this little computer he has? <clears throat> sure, well, John Poindexter is sort of, if there's sort of a narrative protagonist in the Watchers, the Watchers, it's him. And it's nonfiction, it's narrative nonfiction. But it reads like fiction. It reads like fiction, exactly. So exactly. it's very scary because you realize on every page it's true. Right, it's all true, exactly, <laughs> it's happened. Um, but John Poindexter was most famously Ronald Reagan's national security advisor. Uh, brilliant uh, engineer, um, graduated top of his class mm -hmm. from the Naval Academy. I mean, truly of this generation of men who were, you know, groomed to be, you know, leaders of the country. I mean, this, this sort of best and the brightest idea. Worked for Bob McNamara and the Pentagon as part of what was called the Whiz Kids Division, where they were applying mm -hmm. technology and engineering and new thinking and science, trying to solve big national security problems. So he went to go work for the White House in '83. Um, and was the deputy national security advisor right, when, when, Beirut the, when Beirut happened. The suicide truck bomber blew up the marine barracks in Beirut. They were there as part of a peacekeeping mission. And you mission. call that, um, I think interestingly, what introduced us to the idea of the suicide bomber. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there was that and there was another bombing we that were been at the embassy. very naive and innocent before very that, naive. This is, this is very, very much a wake-up moment. This is sort of a new kind of warfare, a new kind of terrorism that people had never really seen But that's before. what Islamic terrorists have thrown at us again and again and again, it seems, wake-up calls. Yeah, yeah, and this was really the first. I mean, this was, you know, people waking up to news of this devastating explosion. 241 Marines were killed, mm -hmm. most of them while they were asleep. Yeah. Poindexter is quite literally woken up about it, actually, because when it happens early in the morning in Beirut, so it's the middle of the night in Washington, he's asleep at home in his home in Rockville, and his he has a phone next to his bed that has a secure line to the White House, right. and it's the Situation Room telling him what's happened. Um, before he goes down to the White House, because Reagan is away, it was actually the weekend that Reagan was at Augusta National, remember where he mm -hmm. had, they had the crazy thing happen where there was a guy with a gun, and he comes in and there was a bit of a scare. So Reagan is sort of manning the post as, or Poindexter is, while the president and the national security advisor are out. So before he goes down to the White House, he goes down to this sort of workshop in his basement where he has this, as you alluded to, this compass computer, which is sort of this prototypical laptop. And if we saw it now, it would look like this sort of clunky, right, thick kind of machine. At the time, it was totally uh, cutting edge. Total space Nobody age. had these things. Right. Yeah, I mean, literally, these things were made to go on, to mm. go into space, right. you know, to be used by astronauts. And he hooked it up, and he had a data connection, what we would now, you know, you know, a Take VPN, right? Right, right, right? He had electronic messaging on this thing. He introduced email to the White House. It mm -hmm. wasn't called email at the time; it was something else. It's called this newfangled this newfangled <laughs> thing that IBM made. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. But it was like science fiction. No, and it, for, it, and but he, for him, this was just these were the tools of the trade. Yeah. And so this becomes a, a big theme in his life: this idea that you can use technology and this new, this this power from these wonderful devices to solve big problems, to run systems, to coordinate yeah. communication. And it becomes sort of a lifelong pursuit for him, and that's what much of the book is about, is can you use this technology and the information to which it is connected to try and basically predict crises before they happen and manage crises when they do? What's so interesting uh, on a parallel track is the terrorists use technology too. Sure. And they've been innovative yeah. in their ways of using it. Are they ahead of us or behind us? I think they're behind us if you look at in the, in the realm of take something like you know, the ability to use the internet to conduct attacks on someone else's computer system. I right. mean, something like recently it's been in the news, um, the U.S. is believed to have created this computer worm that went in and spun the centrifuges in an Iranian nuclear facility out of control. There's been a lot it's of concern. Fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, you know. Mm. It's, 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 it's a little daring <laughs> do. Um, there's, there's been concern for a long time that, you know, could terrorists then take these same viruses and worms and use them against us and yeah. crash electrical grids and this kind of thing. And I think it's generally believed that that kind of operation is more within the realm of a nation state to conduct a military and intelligence service because while it's not impossible, it's fairly difficult to pull off. But where terrorists have been, I think, ahead of us is using the flexibility and the nimble network nature of the internet to communicate, um, to cover their tracks, to recruit. I mean, the internet is the, one reason why Al Qaeda would not attack the internet is it's the best recruitment tool they've ever had. Right, and, and would, would you say that uh, that 9/11 was uh, the, the masterminding of it happened? Wouldn't have happened without the internet. I think it wouldn't have happened without the you know the kind of technology that allows mm -hmm. people to be certainly in different places and to 
communicate rather seamlessly with each other to and, move money around the world very and easily. W the underwear bomber mm -hmm. and somebody and and was it maybe also the Times Square bomber mm -hmm. were both being mentored by a cleric entirely on the internet. Right, who they connected with online, and this is what we're, this is what the intelligence community is finding now is that. The internet is the vehicle for spreading, you know, revolutionary propaganda because Al Qaeda is, you know, it's a revolutionary mm -hmm. movement essentially, and inspiring people to then, you know, connect with yeah. these actors out there. And how do they connect with them? They connect with them online. So it's become this very powerful medium for transmitting the information, but also bringing new people into it and new recruits. And they're very sophisticated about how to use it and how to be very careful with it. I mean, one of the things that tipped off. The intelligence agencies to the possibility that somebody very important, maybe Bin Laden, was hiding inside that house in Pakistan, mm -hmm. was that there were no internet connections in it. It had no digital connection to the outside world. And every other house. And every other house probably did. <laughs> right. In other words, these are people in this house who know that they can be watched right. if they log onto right. a computer. They're trying to. They're trying to be invisible. Right. Well, that's that's one of the that's one of the things I consider very timely. Doing this interview here, we are at practically the end of August. We have the 11th anniversary of 9/11 coming up. Um, where are we? Have we? Are we still running as fast as we can? To keep up with them, are we safer? Have we been, have we been catching them at a rate that's impressive, or are we just barely catching them? Um, so the question of are, are we, how fast are we running to keep up with them? We're ahead of them. Sure, I mean. sure. And to, and to predict and preempt. I mean, there's you sort of put into two categories, trying to pre predict and preempt attacks, and then to go after the known bad guys mm -hmm. that are sort of already on the radar. In terms of being able to identify suspected terrorists and then from that point on learn who their networks are, who are they, where do they go, where are they training. I would say that the intelligence community and the military have become very, very good at traveling all over the world and finding people and killing them. The drone strikes that we read about in Pakistan. Do we hear about everybody they kill? No, no, not at all. I mean, there's, there's, Does that there, reassure you? Um, I guess yes and no. I mean, I mean, I, you know, as a journalist, I mean, I, I take the balanced view that the, you know, national security depends on some level of secrecy. But why I wrote the book is I want to know what is it that the government's out yeah. there doing in our name that we don't know about that could. Do that you have could to be agnostic in a way, as you, um, so that you're not. I mean, that you're not morally offended <laughs> as you... Yeah, well, I mean, I think you have to summon some element of outrage to do this. I mean, you know, the, one of the reasons I wrote the book was, you know, in 2005 it was revealed that the government had been illegally, in my view, monitoring the phone calls and emails of Americans who they suspected of having what they called a nexus to terrorism, which seemed outrageous to me. There's a, there's a procedure for monitoring people who are mm -hmm. Americans who, or U.S. persons who you think might be connected to spies or terrorists, and they weren't following it. And I think that as journalists, we have to you know, take the balanced view that, yes, look, the people, most of the people who are out there working in the intelligence community are dedicated, hardworking people who want to follow the law, and they're protecting us, and we have extraordinary capabilities. But it is our job as reporters to be sort of the, the, this, this check. There are very few mm -hmm. checks on a secret system. And we are really the only ones, absent the intelligence committees, yeah. which really aren't worth much in my estimation for an oversight, who are out there asking questions that people want answered and, and saying, what are you doing in our name? And there, you know, if you look at something like the drone war that's going on in Pakistan or now in Africa that we're learning more about that we did not know about, I think most Americans would probably be on the side of saying, okay, I want you, the military, the mm -hmm. intelligence committee, out there finding these bad guys. You know, I mean, blowing them up. Well, how do you know they're bad? That's one question. Who are the innocents around them? What about the Americans that we've killed? The American citizens. You mentioned the cleric. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, some of what these guys. What did we do with the cleric? We killed him with we a drone. <clears throat> the president effectively, summarily signed his death warrant. But I feel sometimes with uh, the the Islamic terrorists that, uh, much like in the shooting gallery mm -hmm. at the fair, you, you shoot one duck, another one pops up. Yeah, and this, this is, and this is the network nature of terrorism, right? And, and, it's and, and it's, it's uh, uh, but, but also, you know, uh, without advocating anything, it, it's got to be a very fine line you walk close to invading personal privacy in the journey from to uh, from 9/11, mm -hmm. you know, to where we are now. Mm -hmm. to, 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 we, there was so much we had to figure out, right. wasn't there, yeah. about how we how it happened and how we prevent it from happening again? Yeah, because I mean, we really were sort of, in a sense we were caught very flat-footed by the events of that day. 
but I think that people who worked in counterterrorism, the kind of people who before 9-11 were tracking bin Laden, and it was a small number. And that's the embarrassing part. You know, uh, it's one of the things you say in the book that I find so interesting is that this agency knew this, mm -hmm. and this agency knew this, mm -hmm. and this agency knew this, but there was no means of coalescing it Absolutely. in one spot. Yeah, I mean, everybody had their own little piece of a puzzle. Mm -hmm. And I think that intellectually they all knew that they were trying to put together a puzzle, but there was so much distrust among the various players. There were so many legal impediments in their way. There was so mis much misunderstanding of what the legal impediments yeah. actually were that nobody really got together and put it together at the table. You know, a number of people I talked to who were in the book who were sort of in the trenches following Al Qaeda and bin Laden before 9 11, people who worked at the NSA or in the White House or the CIA, could sense that something was going to happen. They didn't know what, they didn't know when, they didn't know what it would look like. And on the day of 9 11, I think that they were sort of momentarily surprised, as we all were and taken aback by it, but very quickly realized this is what we'd been waiting for. This was bound to happen. And, and some of them have never gotten over that, that feeling of absolute right. personal and, failure. But wasn't the piece that was the surprise, not that bin Laden would attack us, but that they would use jets, that they would use yeah. commercial airliners, sure. and that in our free society, they could just climb aboard? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's effectively and, using and you infrastructure can, against you us. You can still, in a lot of ways. Yeah, they've, and they've proven they can get bombs on airplanes still. <laughs> in your underwear. Get, sure, yeah, absolutely. The, 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 you know, that guy was an idiot, and it, and it, and it blew up in his crotch, but, you right. know. Or, well, I mean, it failed to blow up, but, yeah. Or failed, well, something yeah. happened in the his crotch. The fuse went off, yeah. <laughs> Pants on fire. Pants on fire. Uh, much like uh, Times Square, that was a mess up on the sure. part of the, uh, yeah. But we have had successes if, if with what we read is to be believed and preempting some attacks too I mean I think, is, you know, this, this is a very debatable point I mean you know there are <clears throat> I'm hoping you'll know definitively <laughs> yeah, I, I know all sure <laughs> um, yeah we, 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 there are known knowns and known unknowns as Rumsfeld like to say uh, and unknown unknowns it, the case is that you know one of the cases that's been very famous is the, the Bush administration loved to trot out about it that's something that they effectively preempted well, was this guy who was going to try and take down the Brooklyn Bridge with a blowtorch? You know, there are some fairly, fairly laughable examples that could come out. What I think, though, is is not debatable, is that for for many of these people who we have killed in Pakistan, mm -hmm. and I'm not pretending that you know that it is a matter of settled law that it was even legal to do it in some of the cases mm -hmm. that we did, and I'm, I'm certainly not weighing on the morality at this particular moment, but. Um, Undoubtedly, there are plots that we never knew about that we mm -hmm. disrupted because of that. I have, I have no question about that. Part of the strategy for protecting the U.S. has been to take the fight to them and to stop them before they can act. And I think right. that the threshold for when you intervene with a group that you think might be plotting something is dramatically lower than it was before 9-11. We had been Laden quite literally in our sights before 9-11 and for various political factors, did not really take the shot. That would never happen now. We don't hesitate. What, what has filled the void since we killed him? Um, I think that even before he was gone. I mean, what is there a void? Was there a void? No, I or had it, it already it, begun? It was, it was to... morphing. I think it was morphing. I mean, even before 9 when bin Laden was no longer on the scene effectively, and it was presumed to be in hiding, and no one really knew where he was, um, I don't think he really was the operational mastermind that he'd been before 9-11. He certainly was exerting, though, some sort of symbolic influence. I mean, he would occasionally have these messages that he would put out. Um, for a while, you had, you know, uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq sort of coming in to try mm -hmm. and fill a void. Uh, bin Laden had to, had to come in and chastise them for the way they were doing things yeah. as they were blowing up fellow Muslims. Um, but, you know, the nature of this is that it's ideological and that who sort of comes in next is the next generation of people who sort of pick up the cause and adapt it to their current times. So this is where the Internet has been such a powerful recruitment vehicle. You know, it's almost like, you know, Al-Qaeda sort of metastasizes into something else. And now you're looking at Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and mm -hmm. Yemen. Uh, if you want to call that an offshoot of right. Al Qaeda proper, sure. If you're if you're not talking of if you take symbolism out of it, mm -hmm. was it was it more strategically important to get uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed rather than Osama bin Laden? I think probably yes. I mean, I think any time you're talking about disrupting plots, you want to get to the operational but level. This was people. a bad bad. 
bad guy. I yeah. mean, he the, the the lines go to him and uh, sure, sure. I mean, you know, the degree to which he is the the quote unquote mastermind of 9/11, I mm -hmm. think, is debated by some. But I don't think there's any doubt that this was somebody who was plugged into the organization. And you know, it's important to remember too that. While we lost bin Laden in Afghanistan, and he was you know, effectively allowed to escape into Pakistan, I do think that his ability to then conduct strikes and to organize al-Qaeda was greatly diminished. Mm -hmm. And part of the way that the United States has approached counterterrorism writ large is not just by going after these guys and killing them, but also making it very difficult for them to operate as they did before 9-11. Well, what would happen to Mohammed Atta if he tried to get on a plane today in Portland, Maine? Presuming that he was already on some kind of a watch list, uh, there are various degrees of watch lists. Um, if he was on the very and it highest like one, not all of them are as respected as they should be. Yes. Sure, sure. I mean, there, are, there, there, there are these sort of the the watch list that gives people pause, and you get pulled over for secondary screening at the mm -hmm. airport. There's the no-fly list where you don't get on a plane, and then there's a list that you know if they find you, they come arrest you. Um, you know, someone like Mohammed Atta, who very little about him was really known mm -hmm. or shared in the intelligence community and, before 9/11. It would not. I mean, there were actually hits on the what was then the watch list for some of these guys, and they were allowed on 9/11. They were allowed to get on the plane anyway. Um, today, somebody who was flagged as having a connection, a known connection to people that we were on the watch for, we would certainly be pulled aside for further inspection. Um, but you know what you see happening though is that Al Qaeda has tried to go out and recruit people who are not on the radar. I mean, this is why this underwear bomber, he was a kid. He had no paper trail. And the he guy, was not on anybody's And the list. guy in Times Square was here. Yeah. Here. People he had become here. radicalized here. Exactly. Exactly. Why bother trying to get them through our if screening can, systems if, if they're can, already here? If you, can. Sure. you know who else was, uh, you know who it was, I think, who was again, communicating with the cleric was the guy at uh, Fort Hood. Yes, the heat, that's right. I believe that's right. So, yeah. this, so this is so this is you know you don't even have to be here to yeah. Uh, and from their perspective, that's what they want, right? Is they want yeah. the ideology to take hold in people who are here already. Um, changing gears a little bit is uh, is Washington the capital of spooks still? Yeah. Absolutely. Are they are they everywhere around us? Yeah, not only are they are they here and they're everywhere, but they're corporate now. You know, I mean, I think that. What you do know, you mean? Well, you know, for for for. I mean, their front is corporate, or well, no, I mean, they're contractors. I mean, so much of what the intelligence community does today, in terms of how we spy and how we make sense of what we've gathered and all of this, is not just run by people who are working for the federal government or the employee of the government. They work for right. contractors. Right. I mean, I, the percentages are, I, I, I think, you know probably somewhat shrouded in mystery, but I think it suffice to say that the size of the contractor workforce, people who collect a private sector paycheck but work for the government, mm -hmm. is bigger than the number of people who are employed by the U.S. intelligence community. Now, take out the military from that equation. Right, and I do want to take out the military uh, because we expect them to be doing this, and I, and I also expect the CIA to be in this business. And um, and the National Security Council, mm -hmm. et cetera. But what's what's interesting to me is the little intelligence hubs mm -hmm. that are all around us. Sure. That you know we drive by every day. Right. That might be in the house next door right. or the, the office next state. door. Yeah, sure. And I wondered if you'd talk a little bit about uh, where some of these places are. And I want to start with one that's always intrigued me because it's it's near uh, a Safeway I go to mm -hmm. out in Sangamore. It's the defense mapping. And now, of course, I go right back and talk about the Defense Department. But the Defense Mapping Agency, I mean, isn't that like something right out of 24 hours? <laughs> yeah, exactly. These, well, these are people like the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Right. You know, this is the mapping agency that are you know, managing the satellites that are up there. This Google Maps I came mean, Talk the, about technology that was first right. used in the, in the government. Go. Google Maps was a technology developed I for the government. I actually looked at Google things. Maps once for my house and zoomed in on my house. And it was my front window with my dog looking at the window. <laughs> so, yes, you're right. Yeah, 10 years ago, that was the CIA that had access to that, not me and you. Well, are, are they watching us as we walk around downtown? It's passive. You know, I, I think the image of some of, of you know, someone or for some room full of people sitting there and watching a bank full of TV screens and each person going by, that's probably a little bit more Hollywood. The system is much more passive. I mean, there is a system of surveillance around us, capturing images, ca capturing credit card receipts, emails, phone calls, and it's all being stored. And it's not just being stored by intelligence agencies. Mm -hmm. Corporations 
store this information and then either share it with the government or are required to get Amazon, it over. can you imagine uh, places like Amazon, Facebook, how much they know about us? Absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, Google has become, I think, a fairly reliable partner to the National Security Agency in sharing information about what it sees coming across its networks. Now, from their perspective, companies are happy to comply, but it has to be done legally. Yeah. It has to be done, and, and the lawyers on both sides check this. This is why you know, the, the great heartburn for these companies over the past five years has been looking at the government for 10 years, really, and saying, is what you're asking us to do legal? Mm -hmm. Is it legal for us to give you what it is that you want? And that has been you know, a process that is utterly shrouded in mystery and secrecy. Uh, it's not uh, something that journalists are allowed to sort of go through the files and see what the requests have been mm -hmm. over the years. There's no public court where these things are aired which is one of the reasons why it's, you know, I think, imperative for, for people like me to keep asking these questions of companies and of the government. What is it that you know about us? What is it that you're sharing with each other? Mm -hmm. What are you doing with the information? Yeah. We know a little bit about the laws that govern acquiring information. We know next to nothing about what happens to that data once it's been captured. Um, I suppose the best of them, but there's no way of knowing who has that kind of makeup. Um, filters the information and the things they find. It's, it's much like when you go through the scanner at the airport. Mm -hmm. I, I want to believe that whoever's looking at my naked body has already seen so many naked bodies that they're really just trained. They're not impressed. Well, right? they're not impressed. They're looking they're, for specific indicators. And that, sure. and that it, and at, the, at the best of it, the intelligence uh, industry would be scanning constantly, acquiring our information, <coughs> but quickly discarding what's not relevant, hopefully. There's, there's more of it that they could possibly look at. That's, that, that is the, sort of the problem in a nutshell for the intelligence community, mm -hmm. is that the amount of data is absolutely overwhelming. I mean, talking about the underwear bomber, there were actually some fairly salient and interesting data points, if you want to call them that, on him. There are ways in which he had sort of popped up, not exactly on watch lists per se, mm -hmm. But, but in retrospect, he wasn't a completely unknown quantity, yeah. and there were there were sort of indicators and warnings about him that if you put them together, you might say, "Wait a minute, go look at this guy." But it was literally a set of indicators and warnings full of thousands of them that are out there. There's very little in the way of technology that can filter through it, prioritize it, make sense of it quickly, and tell you that's the guy to go look yeah. at. What we're good at is, based on the people that we've already tracked is blowing out their social networks. Mm -hmm. you know, it's having a known target and a known place to start gets you um, a lot further than fishing around in the dark for the underwear bombers. It's two very different kinds of intelligence problems. Do New York and Washington have similar frameworks <coughs> of security, screening? I mean, I know it has to be that since 9-11, uh, certainly Washington, there must be, you know, there, there's little cameras everywhere right. in the tops of buildings. I believe they have sensors for gas everywhere. Sure. I mean, but I'm not going to say we're a police state, but we're a security state, aren't we? Like it, it, never it's, before. It's more intense in New York, though. Really? Yeah. It because, is. just because? <laughs> because it's New York. Um, because. Um, but the I president's here. The, the president is here, and the president is protected by his own <laughs> security apparatus. Separate from the us. Secret Service, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I mean, the New York Police Department, just to give you an example, has a counterterrorism and an intelligence unit that rivals rivals that of the FBI and the CIA. In the case of some, you know, past terrorist incidents, people from the New York Police Department have been on the ground overseas faster than people from the FBI have. And I think a, a big part of the reason for that is it's a much, remember, it's a much larger city mm -hmm. than, than, than Washington is. Um, it has been a target repeatedly. It's been hit before in 1993. And I think that you have in the leadership of the city and as well as the police department some people who are deeply, deeply committed mm -hmm. to making sure that doesn't happen again. And their answer to that has been to build probably one of the most ambitious extensive programs of surveillance, monitoring, investigation, intelligence gathering. The New York Police yeah. Department looks nothing like what it did before 9-11, if you're looking at it through that lens. It is much more like a spy agency now. Mm -hmm. and it, did they recruit from Washington? Um, I think or did the, they create their own? I think they created their own and recruited from Washington, mm -hmm. and then the collaboration is very, very close. Is there good money in that line of work? Sure. Absolutely. I mean, not in government, but once you get out of it, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the revolving door in this area is is considerable. Um, you know, it, it's it's you can sell your expertise 
on the private market at a much higher rate than you can in government. Yeah. The, the, this is what I'm talking about. You know, the, the it's almost indistinguishable whether you you know what color badge you wear. Mm -hmm. You know, or where who signs your check. You're all working for the same program, the same agency. It's but just not the, necessarily speaking to each other. You know, you talk about New York having this elite, ex, you know, extravagant and highly sophisticated security apparatus and 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 you know interestingly and I don't want to regret saying these words but DC hasn't been attacked Virginia was attacked uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know it's very interesting we and I, I, I'm actually been around long enough to remember when the Capitol got bombed right but that was domestic that was which is something else I wanted to ask you to what extent do the elite intelligence agencies pay attention to domestic terrorism I think closely. I think there's always a question of how much I mean, can you watch it. Does that fall into their net? It, it falls into the FBI's net. Uh -huh. The FBI is the lead agency on any terrorist, any terrorist act. And when it, when, if it's in the United States, it's a law enforcement operation. But to the extent that there is a connection between an incident that happens here and terrorists or groups abroad, right. the intelligence community is absolutely a part of that. I mean, take what happened in Aurora. Right. You know, in the movie, th movie theater shooting a, a, a month or so ago. And you know why that's also such a good example? Is uh, sort of like bin Laden or others, you know? The guy was on some radar. Right. Well, locally, from people locally, in his but community. He was on, but he was on some radar. <clears throat> right. But now, well, I don't think any of that was being reported to the government. No, no. But, but you know, there you have it. He was, if you remember, you know, James Holmes, who is the, you know, the accused uh, shooter, um, very quickly the statements were coming out that they, that the government's finding no connection to terrorism. And I've never actually asked anybody the question, but my presumption would be that they very quickly ran that name right, through right. the databases and realized there was no connection. Um, uh, not necessarily like what happened in, in the mosque, in the, or I mean, in the, in the, in the, with, with the Sikh shooting. The Sikh temple, right, yeah. the Sikh temple, where you know it was sort of initially called this act of domestic terrorism. It's very interesting to watch well, what gets labeled crime, terrorism and I, what doesn't. I, you know, I think yeah. it's, it was a hate crime. But, but to answer your question, yes, they're all paying attention. But it's I mean, a question is it who the takes the lead kind is of different. Technology and smarts that's looking for these people who can still kill us. I don't Regardless think. Regardless of where they're coming from. Well, I don't think the technology can help us find those people. Really? I mean, I, I wrote about this for Washingtonian not long after it happened, the, uh, the Aurora shooting. I don't think that the apparatus that the intelligence community, let's say, that's out there scanning the data, would have found mm -hmm. Holmes. They just, he, the signature that he was leaving to the degree that he was leaving one wasn't remarkable. And they, he dropped out of school. Okay, probably lots of people did. He did it over email. That's not particularly novel. He bought guns. He bought them legally. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing that he was doing would necessarily distinguish him from hundreds or potentially thousands of other people. And when it does occur in the United States, there's a greater sensitivity because yeah. the intelligence community doesn't have as free a hand to operate here, although they have a much freer hand than they did have before 9-11. A lot of, you know, you've written about drones. Mm -hmm. I think drones are fascinating. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and, because, uh, you know, they, they do feel kind of Jetsons-like, and yet they're being used extensively yeah. now. And, uh, they're cool, but they kill people, but too. They're cool, yeah. but they kill people, and uh, they're going to evolve and yeah. continue evolving. <clears throat> but can a swarm of drones do things like catch a Muhammad Atta? Can a, what, what, it's limited what drones can sure. do. That's one question. Mm -hmm. And are we ever going to see drones flying around over us? Yeah, well, to the second question, yes, and you'll probably see them in the next couple of years. Will they be visible? Um, some of them probably will. People will be How weird will that be? I think we'll get used to it, actually, pretty quickly. Really? It'll seem You'll go outside? I think it'll seem weird, and then it'll seem no weirder than when you see, you know, a, a MedStar helicopter going right, by, or DC right. police, or the traffic copter. Why will it be up there? Um, watching traffic, watching us, law enforcement prevention. Helping, uh, so these are just domestic peaceful drones? Well, these will be surveillance drones. Right. They won't be armed, hopefully. Um, they will sort of be taking the place that, you know, the thing what police call but helicopters is, and traffic helicopters do. You say they won't be armed, do. but the technology exists because they already use it sure. for a drone to chase a bad guy who's just mugged or shot somebody and the police want to get them and they don't want to lose an officer in the process, right? Sure. I mean, I think if we're, if we're talking like, let's say 10, 15 years from now, maybe even less, we're talking science fiction. Like what I'd be writing if I were writing the screenplay mm -hmm. for you know Minority Report or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you have these tiny little drones the size of hummingbirds that tra chase a guy who just robbed you know a liquor store, right. and you know when given the clearance, land on him and like you know 
shoot, you know, and blow dart in his neck or whatever and knock uh -huh. him out and the cops come and arrest him. Uh -huh. Look how we do high speed chases, you know, where the helicopters go over and you see right. the guy, light, you know, and the police go in front of him and line, you know, take the chains and lay them out with the spikes on it and blow his tires out. Get a robot to do that. Will drones, will the, will the young men who are um, eight or nine years old right now, because of drones, will they maybe never have to go into combat if they go into the military? I don't know that they'll never go into combat. I think that if you're talking about pilots, it's entirely possible that the fleets of the future will be, the air fleets so will largely be. So there'll be fewer pilots, be, but we'll still have ground troops? I think so. I think so because there are some things that, you know, there, that the conventional human forces will probably be better able to do. but. I think that the, the distinction will be made. The question will be asked, can a robot do this just as well as a human or do it almost as well or even better with less loss of life? And that equation will become sort of permeate all of the decisions about how we fight. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if you're looking 30 years from now, could you have, you know, robot soldiers? Sure, absolutely. Could it look like Terminator? Yes, I think it could definitely look like that in the future. Now, people in the military and the senior officers who, in the Air Force and the guys who run the drones now mm -hmm. will tell you we would never, ever, ever delegate the decision on when to kill and when to fire to a robot. I think that's How? absolutely not true. <laughs> yeah, and if you look over their own history, they're moving towards well, that. Yeah, you know, because right now we have a, uh, in effect, a drone on Mars. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, do we use ground devices like that in combat right now? Sure. Yeah, I mean, we, we send, I mean, we use drones for disarming IEDs in Iraq and Afghanistan. The, 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 right, right, right. Well, yeah, we, we, we use those kinds of things. I mean, in terms of the armed drones, the most, the most of that is in the air right now. But we're developing, not we, companies are developing, working for the military, you know, drones that will be able to be on land yeah. and go into it. It's harder on land. It's a lot easier to fly around and yeah, blow things up. Yeah, that's what basically what Hurt Locker was about. The, 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 the little rolly thing could only do so much, right. and then the human had to go in and, yeah, it's a lot and, harder risk, on his, land. and risk his life. That's right. Um, well, I, you know, I think that... Uh, did GPS get uh, developed because of the um, intelligence industry? Uh, I believe it did, actually. I mean, it, it, oh, okay. The specific history of GPS it, it probably eludes me at the second. You won't, you won't believe the time is flying by, and there are a couple other things I wanted, to, I wanted to, I wanted to get to that are not exactly on intelligence, but um, I wanted to ask you what a presidential election means to the intelligence community. Do they see it as just a great big tedious nuisance? And if this one guy that now we're accustomed to goes and a new guy comes in, we're just going to have to go back to zero again? No, they don't see it as going back to zero. I think that they see it as their job is to make sure that regardless of who the commander in chief is, that there is total continuity in the, oper in the system, the operations of, of the intelligence community and the, and the whole national security apparatus. In fact, what, <clears throat> what you saw in the, in, the, in the last election, and this has really been ramping up to, to almost being sort of a perfect kind of handoff, mm -hmm. where then Senator Obama and Senator McCain began receiving classified national security briefs from the Director of National Intelligence mm -hmm. at the time, Mike McConnell, not long after they received the party's nomination. They started getting basically not the sexiest stuff, but getting the lay of the land of what mm -hmm. the threats are and what the capabilities are that we have to go out there Tutorials. and deal with these things. Tutorials, making sure that they were up to speed because it was, it was very important from their perspective and very important personally to President Bush. He's talked about this. He did not want anybody coming in on day one having to get up to speed or being surprised mm -hmm. by what he found out. And I think also that they, from the intelligence community's perspective, if you're talking about the politics of this, they would rather have the opportunity to go in there and take these, you know, these two guys who've been out on the campaign, pretending they know everything, making grand pronouncements about policy, and say, well, let me show you how it really works. Let me show you what's actually on the table here. And with the effect of hopefully maybe tempering it a little bit Do and bringing them to their side. Have you ever felt you've noticed in the rhetoric of a campaign the moment when the nominee has all of a sudden been given a pretty heavy briefing? Mm -hmm. and they, and you I can, remember Obama's. And you can see in their eyes that all of a sudden yeah. they know more? You could mark it with Obama's. You could you could see it. He, cha he changed positions. He changed tone. I, for, the, for the book, I interviewed a couple of people who were in the room with him. And, you know, and they said to me, you know, this is when he got the first brief in Chicago. Uh, and they said, you know, you see this a lot with people who are, 
realizing that they're going to become the president now. Mm -hmm. And it just sort of starts to sink in. In his case, even that he might become president, yeah. it starts to sink in. The comment that he made was, uh, after he got sort of the, the threat briefing, uh, it's about two months out from the election, he said, you know, before you guys came in here, I was worried that I might lose the election, and now I'm afraid I might win. Um, if I don't know that they grade presidents, but let's say hypothetically they did, how would you think the intelligence community would grade Obama versus Bush versus Clinton? Um, if you're looking at, take politics, you know, policy out of it strictly on right. the national no, security that's thing. Why I, don't want politics I think Clinton would probably get probably low on the scale. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of people who still feel that he didn't do enough. He does not feel that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he famously had the exchange with Chris Wallace where mm -hmm. they got into it about that. Um, but no doubt there was, you know, he, Clinton will claim that he tried and that, you know, he did the best he could. Um, Bush will be credited for greatly accelerating um, the... Putting money in it. Putting money into it, making it his absolute obsession. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is not an understatement to say that that but man woke that up and went to bed with it every day. But is that the same as being sophisticated about understanding No, it? not at yeah. all. And yeah. I think that he will be dinged considerably for that and yeah. it, will, it will, will not be viewed kindly in history. I think he took sort of a... A, a very rough view of things and, w and was far too quick to set up in secret things that he should have done in public. But he will get credit for focusing the attention on and giving it the money. And Obama, I think, will be seen as someone who continued everything that Bush had done, uh, accelerated much of it, and had much better lawyers. Um, do they? Do, do you think Romney's already getting these briefings, or will it be after the he's convention? He's not getting them yet. What he's getting right now is he has people on his staff, some of whom were senior members of the Bush administration, mm -hmm. who are his advisors on these issues. Um, after the convention, probably four or five days or so after, he'll get his first official brief. Um, do you know anything about the National Security Journalism Program taught at Northwestern? No, but it sounds like I should. Yeah, no. Okay, well, I'm sorry you don't because I wanted you to tell me all about it, Shane. But uh, no, I and, and doing my research, this this came along, and I thought uh, I thought isn't that interesting that that you go and get taught how to cover this beat? Which you know, now that you mentioned this, though, Carol, I'm thinking I I'm, I think that it's not quite right that I don't know anything about that because if because I'm not you mistaken, gave a speech and they paid you a lot of money. No, actually, no. I think it's your. I'm not. I'm, I'm blank. A friend of mine actually did a fellowship with them, okay. and and talked to me uh, for a project that he did on data mining. Um, but this is, you know, it, it's programs like this. It's very interesting that they're being taught in journalism schools now, because you know I always joke that I mean, you know, basically I have job security as a journalist because this subject is not going away. Right. I mean, we're really in sort of the. We're only ten years out of 9/11. Yeah, yeah. I mean, think of how long the Cold War was. Right. This has only begun to start. Well, We're how, only beginning to understand the contours And the here. rapid uh, pace of uh, technological innovation. Yes, which always outstrips the law and everything else you know, uh, faster. Uh, but, uh, so that's, that's, that's a path for a, for a journalist. What's the path for um, a, a non-journalist who wants to go into the security industry? Um, I, I imagine one route is the military, one route's <coughs> police, depending on what you want to do. But let's say you want to become you know, an analyst, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, where you want to be the guy analyzing the data. Sure. What you call the data mining. Sure, sure. Um, well, the CIA and the other intelligence agencies saw applications go way, way up after 9-11. They're, they're fortunate now in the sense that when it comes for counterterrorism and these kinds of things, they have more people wanting to come to work for the government than, mm -hmm. than, than they can hire. Where they're still deficient, though, is languages, you know, Arabic, Pashto, yeah. Um, it, it, they're still deficient in people who have skills in internet security, which mm -hmm. is going to be the next big thing. Um, I think what people are finding in the intelligence community is that the path to how do we hire people is pretty obvious, right? They apply, everyone wants to work here, it's great, mm -hmm. it's cool, we go out and recruit, that's fine. But they can't pay them what they could make in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And this has been a great, great problem, is how do you hire the best people and retain them? Because the intelligence community has found in the past 10 years that they're no different than any other workforce. People come in out of college, they're 25 or so, they have very little experience, yeah. they work for the CIA for four years, then they leave. They go do something else. They go to cooking school. They go work for a contractor. <laughs> they don't see it as a 35-year career the way that their parents did. When I was at NBC eons ago, our desk assistant got recruited by the CIA and he just disappeared one day. Really? Yeah. 
never heard from him again. <laughs> I mean, he had special skills. I don't know what they were. Right, specific uh, ones. Yeah, but probably not allowed to talk about them. Uh, before we end, um, I, I want to say have some apple cider. And, oh, thank and you. And this is a cupcake from you for, for you from our, from our sponsor, Georgetown Cupcake. And you thought I was kidding when I said I wanted to talk to you about UFOs. Oh, okay. But in my I'm research... Have some apple cider. Yes, first. have some apple cider. Uh, in my research, I came upon things that talk about the intelligence industry and UFOs. Sure. Um, do they have to at least pay lip service to that? Do they have to at least wonder when things are reported that don't make any sense? You know, I, I like when to airline pilots come back and say. I sure. I like to think so. Yeah. I mean, I like to think that there is still somebody so else's drone might be. Well, sure. Now, I think then you raise a very good point here. For now, in all seriousness, you know, reports of things that people see in the, in the sky and they, and they don't. It's very good apple cider, and they don't know what they are. Right. I mean, sure, you want to make sure that this isn't like you know some Chinese drone that's been flying around in the airspace, and certainly during the Cold War, the, the, the tensions I think were probably much higher for that. Right. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, it's, it's a very intriguing question in the degree to which the intelligence community pays some kind of special attention to the possibility uh, that something is out there. I mean, it's not my domain of expertise, right. but, you know, the military is, you know, famous for wanting to have a plan for anything. And you there, is, the table, there's got to be an alien invasion plan. I mean, come on. <laughs> on that note. <laughs> Well, um, we got through this. Yeah. You were great. This is fun. Yeah. No, we'll do it again. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank you Shane. very much, Carol. <laughs> and uh, please tune in again next time for the Q&A Cafe. Thank you very much.